Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have food on the menu. Right now, we're surviving mostly on mealwood. And while it's not a big deal, considering we have a thousand tons of dirt, pickled meal gives us a minus one grizzly quality. And that's not something that we want to sustain our colony on. But because we learned Takarini has a liquid sulfur source, we're going to go into grub fruit. Now, the first thing we have to do is examine the two different types of grub fruit plants just to make sure we understand what we're getting into. The standard spindly grub fruit plant requires 10 kilos of sulfur per cycle. Not a bad deal. Takes four cycles to grow, and when all said and done, you have 800 calories. The way you want to plan out your food, though, is calories per cycle, and in this case, 800 calories over four cycles is 200 calories per plant which means it would take five spindly grub fruit plants to feed one dew. And that's just the same as the amount of mealwood. The difference becomes when we take that spindly grub fruit and bring it over to the kitchen, we learn that the spindly grub fruit itself can be cooked into roasted grub fruit nut for 1,200 calories, which means you only really need to plant is four of these to feed one dew because four of them would give you 800 calories and then the 800 calories would turn into 1,200 and it would give you a plus one quality to the food. But if we try to cultivate grub fruit plants, we then get grub fruit for 2000 calories over eight cycles. Not a big difference. This one's only 250 calories per cycle. And you get that from the 2000 calories divided by the eight cycles of domesticated growth. But then with a little bit of sucrose, we can turn it into grub fruit preserve, which turns into a plus three quality food. So end state is we're going to go from a grizzly minus one to a poor plus one to eventually a good quality plus three. Now remember the plus three, the minus one, the plus one don't necessarily mean the morale bonuses. By going to our consumables, we can actually see that the plus three good quality food ends up giving our duplicates a plus eight to morale. Whereas the roast grub fruit nut actually gives you a plus one to morale. Now the differences between these plants aren't too terribly bad. They both have the body temperature range of 15 to 50. They can grow in oxygen, polluted oxygen, or carbon dioxide. But the grub fruit plant requires being tended to by a divergent critter, such as the Sweetle. Hence the reason all of these spindly grub fruit plants here have turned into just regular grub fruit plants, because there's Sweetles down here to tend to them. Whereas on these rows, there are no Sweetles. It doesn't mean you actually need to tame the Sweetles. It doesn't mean any of that. You just have to have Sweetles in there. Now the advantage to actually feeding and taming these Sweetles is the fact that they will excrete sucrose. And when we head back here to the grill, we can see that the grub fruit preserve actually requires four kilos of sucrose. Now right now we have 21 tons of the stuff, so it would last a long time, but there's no sugar volcanoes that I know of. So you need to come up with a different method in order to get the sucrose. The question then becomes, where do we get our sulfur? We already know that over in Takarini, that we can get to through the teleporter as a liquid sulfur geyser. So now the issue just becomes, where is it? How do we support dupes on this planet? And then how do we maintain transporting it over to our main planetoid? Well, that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna find a couple of dupes and we're gonna send them over to Takarini and start getting a handle on that mess. Now, we wanna actually send two dupes. Sending one dupe has its own set of problems. If the one dupe gets into trouble, there's not another dupe there to help them out. So who do we send? What skills are they gonna need? Well, this is another deal. Because at a minimum, they're gonna need to be able to research the geyser to, so we can figure out how much liquid sulfur we're actually getting out of it. They're gonna need to be able to dig. They're also gonna need to be able to run on power wheels because again, we're not putting any sort of power production on the other planetoid, save for manual generators. Well, the first dupe we've decided is going to be Lindsay. Lindsay actually has a love of doing research. So they'll be heading over there. And then I think we're actually gonna send Ellie. Ellie has no particular skill set that we care about. They're just a standard runner. Either way, I think they'll be able to keep Lindsay just enough company. So Ellie and Lindsay, you're heading on over. All right, this place is not great. We didn't leave it in the best of conditions. 
It's doing okay on oxygen for now, and we have about 11 cycles worth of food for one dupe. It'll be a few cycles for this teleporter to recharge to send over the next duplicate. Another problem on this colony is there's actually very little water, so I think that calls for an actual bathroom loop. These bedrooms look fairly oxygenated, so we will make sure that Lindsay knows she is sleeping over there. And then there's a bunch of muckroot over here. We might as well go grab all this up. It'll at least give us a few more cycles worth. Now what's key is we need to put Lindsay into not only advanced research, but field research so they can actually do the geographical analysis on the geysers. For now, we're just going to dig up the occasional muckroots that we see around grab all these eggshells, and once we get to this supply teleporter input, we'll make sure that we're always sending eggshell back. I'm a little concerned that the sulfur geyser is going to be here inside the oil biome. It's a little warmer down here, and I did not want to crack into the oil biome quite yet. There is another geyser here, though, but we're going to wait for the next dupe to come over, because the next dupe is going to have the digging to be able to get it through here. And yes, Lindsay is already peeing herself because we don't have bathrooms set up. Of all the places to pee, Lindsay, the clean water supply was not one of them. All right, so we've put a temporary stopgap into the place. We gave Lindsay an outhouse. We've put a couple of mess tables here that'll turn this into a dining hall. And then we added a beautiful mini pod. Now, the reason why we want to add the mini pods that one of the narratives of the Great Escape now is to establish five colonies. And you do that by putting mini pods on different planetoids. All right, the teleporter transmitter has been recharged. Come on over, Ellie. Actually, before we send Ellie over, let's go ahead and skill scrub her. Let's get rid of the operating skills that she has so we can put her into some digging. She's gonna love that. We're gonna need to get some materials over from the other planet, which Lindsay's gonna activate this supply teleporter outputter, and it actually requires field research to be able to do it. Now, why it requires field research to just put your little four-fingered hand on the device, I don't know. Is it four fingers or is it three fingers and a thumb? Ellie's been skill scrubbed and like I said, she's not gonna like this very much, but sorry, Ellie, you're now a digger. And now that we have Ellie the digger, we can get over here into this geyser here, hoping that it's the liquid sulfur, but my luck, it'll be a chlorine vent. With two dupes over here, we're going to consume this oxygen that we have remaining rather quickly. So it's time to put down some basic oxygen generation. Right now, we're going to use algae with an oxygen diffuser. We have a little over two tons of algae, which isn't a ton, no pun intended, considering it takes 550 grams of algae per second. What I think we're going to do is eventually put in a bathroom system that feeds into an electrolyzer. Yes, they're going to breathe the air generated by their pee. And you might be wondering, well, why are we forcing them to do that? Well, because there's not actually any source of oxygen or water on Takarini. And yet we need to live on Takarini. And the only positive source of water I know is urination. So trying to figure out an easy food source for our Takarini planetoid. And I realized, you know what would be easy? Just sending a pip so that they can wild plant their heart out. There's already some decent wild plants here. And I think by just enabling auto harvest, we might actually be able to feed all the dupes here. Well, this didn't exactly turn out the way I'd hoped. Another pause bug. I was actually on Takarini and was deconstructing something when the game decided to save. Well, I thought I canceled everything until I come over to here to Shibura and uh, uh, apparently we have big problems. Not only that, Something's going on with the oxygen supply. I mean, this is a mess. So much got deconstructed before I knew what was happening. Half the bathrooms aren't working. The oxygen delivery system has been utterly dismantled. Even some of the battery box got destroyed. Well, I guess the moral of the story is don't save your games, folks. <laughs> okay, the disaster looks mostly diverted. I still got some little things to clean up here and there, but we're back onto the path of surviving now. So once again, this has bitten me in the butt, so I wanted to highlight it again. I couldn't figure out why field research wasn't being done. Oh, that's right. We don't allow anyone to do research by default. So let's make sure she's allowed to do it and uh, call that one solved. All right, here's the duplicate's new living situation. We moved the cots over here. I'll explain why in a minute. And here's their new bathroom setup. Remember I told you we're actually going to be able to gain water out of this setup and 
basically what happens is every time they used the lavatory, this guy right here, it cost us 5 kilos of clean water. But it produces 11.7 kilos, which means you actually have a net gain of a little over 6 kilos per cycle. Why per cycle? Well, duplicates use the bathrooms once per cycle. So that means we have 12 whole kilos per cycle to do something with. Normally, we feed some thimble reeds. Well, this time we're doing something a little bit more disgusting. The dirty water comes through the water sieve, goes down here, and at first fills up the sink, the shower, and the lavatory. If these are already full, it'll bypass this bridge, come on up here and head into this tank, where it is absolutely chocked full with the germiest water you've ever seen. And what are we going to do? We're going to provide it to an oxalizer and feed it to our duplicants in the form of oxygen. You're welcome, duplicants. I'm here for you. Now, is this system enough to sustain them? No. Well, why do we know that? Well, because a duplicate consumes 100 grams of oxygen per second, which means in 10 seconds, it's one kilo of oxygen. In 60 seconds, well, you guessed it, six kilos of oxygen. We also know that there's 600 seconds in a cycle, so we know every duplicate consumes, on average, 60 kilos of oxygen per cycle. A little more if they're a mouth breather, a little less if they have diver's lungs. The way you got to look at it is you need 60 kilos of oxygen per cycle. Well, we know what happens when we put in one kilo of water into our electrolyzer. It produces 888 grams of oxygen. So, you know, when you put our 12 extra kilos of water into the electrolyzer, it's actually only a little over 10 kilos of oxygen, which means we're still about 50 kilos shy per day. I'm not too worried about it. There's still algae on this planet. And additionally, there's a ton of rust. And we're going to take all that rust and we're going to put it through one of these rust deoxidizers. It's going to make us oxygen and turn that rust into iron that we'll send back to the home colony. Another built-in feature with this open air electrolyzer is we've made a vent shaft. And the purpose of the vent shaft is for all the hydrogen be able to release. Now, I don't want it actually venting the vacuum of space because we'll lose a lot of oxygen that way. But you can see... All the hydrogen is slowly lifting all the way up here. Now, it's not a perfect system. It is definitely stopgap, but it at least add a little bit of oxygen to the environment and supplement everything else we're doing. I have one other idea as soon as we get our hands on some bleach stone, and that's going to be to put this entire tank into a chlorine bath. I'm then going to add a timer to this electrolyzer that says, hey, you don't run unless it's like once per cycle for X amount of time, and the whole the meantime, this tank is sitting in a chlorine bath, not actually emptying. As a matter of fact, we actually do have some bleach stone on this map somewhere that I just haven't seen, but the dupes have found. Let me see what I can set up. This is the beginning of our little chlorine room. We've already poured a little bit of water, which basically liquid locks this area. Now we just got to get the rest of that junk out of there. Do that. We'll just take our beautiful gas pump here and we'll send it over right here yeah there's not enough gas pressure here it should be able to get everything out of that room without overpressurizing this gas vent our gas pump is doing its business won't take too long and i know this is a little bit of a sidetrack from what we were doing but this is just another nice little tight system that will really clean up the water it'll be dupe maintenance free in fact this liquid lock is not the strongest liquid lock in the world but the fact is once we set this system up dupes aren't going to be going in and out of this area so there's no chance for the liquid lock to break. Well, there's always a chance. It is Ani, but you know what I'm talking about. Plus, in the meantime, before we tackle this thing, it's still dormant for another 38 cycles. So truth be told, I have some in-game time to blow before I can actually show the rest of the episode with handling our liquid sulfur geyser. Speaking of chlorine and bleach stone, someone in the comments actually mentioned in reply to our last episode where we set up our beautiful infinite kitchen setup, that it'd be better if we used chlorine in here instead of carbon dioxide. And that way, any food that gets put it back in the system that has a potential for food poisoning would be cleaned off. And they're right. But at the time, I didn't think we had any bleach stone. After looking, it does look like we have just over a ton, so that is something we would be able to do. 
and I just noticed there's some obsidian in my deep freezer. This has to go. Which actually reminds me that I need to set up another system. In the eventuality that something goes off in here, because let's say the base has a giant deconstruct command over it, well, some of the food may actually get out of deep freeze. We don't want that to happen. We set a storage bin here to collect any polluted dirt and rot pile that comes out of here. And then this auto super will grab all the polluted dirt and stick it in this storage bin. And because we've set it at a low priority, the dupes will then come by, grab it out of here, and put it where it goes. The convenient thing about having a storage bin here, though, is anytime you want to get something out of the deep freezer that's not set up in automation, well, we just select it. For instance, let's just hit raw mineral. And the auto super goes and grabs the obsidian, puts it in the container, and then we can just unselect it. And now all of a sudden, the obsidian is no longer in our deep freezer. And all is well in the world again. And look at this. Our little chlorine room is completely vacuumed out. Now all we have to do is put a little bit of bleach stone right here. And we'll be good as gold. All right, here's our completed little system. We put a little bit of automation in here. And here's why. Whenever we add freshly cleaned urine to this liquid reservoir, it's going to reintroduce food poisoning germs to the water. And it takes some amount of time for the chlorine to have an impact on the water and get rid of all the germs. Step one, let's go ahead and add the bleach stone now. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, we have 280 kilos of bleach stone in this room. Now you can tell the entire room is nothing but a chlorine bath. And look at these germs just plummet. Man, you really have to love the power of chlorine in this game. And just like that, the liquid reservoir is clean. No germs whatsoever. Lindsay's about to change that fact. Using the latrine is the one process in the whole bathroom that actually produces that extra water. From that 5 kilos all the way up to 11 point something. So now we're going to follow the polluted water into the sieve around and back into our beautiful liquid reservoir. Let's speed it up a bit. And here they are. Now watch what happens when this packet gets introduced to this liquid reservoir. Instantly, another 13,000 germs have been added. Which means we need a way to wait until all the germs are gone. There is the liquid pipe germ sensor. The problem with these sensors is you really have to tie up where the pipe is versus where your chlorine is. Long story short, it can be a pain in the butt to make sure that your liquid pipe germ sensor is in the right spot. So what we're going to do instead is just kind of wing it. We have a timer sensor connected to a liquid shutoff. And what we're going to do is say, hey, 20 seconds out of every cycle, go ahead and pump some water. Now, I'm not exactly sure on this timing because it may take the electrolyzer 30 seconds. But we're going to play with it a little bit and try to get it down to just enough water for the electrolyzer to run and also making sure that our liquid reservoir doesn't get backed up as well. So we'll start with a 20 out of 600. We'll reset it just so we can watch the beautiful new clean water come through the pipes. And this was enough water to fill this entire pipe and the electrolyzer is now creating oxygen using clean water. And that 20 seconds seems to be about perfect the electrolyzer is using its last bit of water inside the pipes now, and our timer is about to fire off. Now we can turn our attention to the liquid sulfur geyser. When you do the math, and since I haven't done this in a quick minute, I'll show everybody how to do it. You figure out the percentage on the eruption period, which is 381 seconds, divided by 712 seconds, which gives you 53.5%. And then to figure out the active period, you divide 113.6 cycles every 192.9 cycles, and you get about 58.8%. You then multiply the eruption period times the active period, so 53.5 times 58.8%, you get about 31.5%. What does that mean? That means based on this eruption period and active period, when you multiply it out, you can consider that this geyser is going to erupt for 31.5% of the time. The reason why you need that is because this liquid sulfur geyser produces 4,782.5 grams per second only during its eruption period 
and only during its active period. Now that we know that this geyser is active and erupting 31.5% of the time, we can multiply that by the 4,782.5 grams and we get a grand total of 1,506 grams per second. So when you have this number, this 1,506 grams, we know that we can count on an average of 1,506 grams per second for the lifetime of this colony. What's even better is you can take that 1,506 grams or for simplicity's sake, 1.5 kilos and multiply it by 600 seconds in a cycle and we get about 900 kilos per cycle. Why do we care about 900 kilos? Well, when we go over here to our beautiful spindly grub fruit plant, we can see that it takes 10 kilos of sulfur per plant. Same thing for our regular grub fruit plant, which means we could run 90 grub fruit plants and still be okay on sulfur. Well, what is 90 grub fruit plants feed? In fact, we'll use the spindly grub fruit since it's not a good of a plant we can estimate that the 90 grub fruits times the 200 calories per cycle that the spindly grub fruit produces, that's the 800 divided by the four cycles, that's 18,000 calories per cycle. That's not even taken into account the fact that most of them are going to be grub fruit plants producing even more, or the fact that when we take that grub fruit, it's going to turn it into 1,200 calories. So to try to make this a little simpler, Let's look at it as far as total plants. We know we're gonna be able to run 90 spindly grub fruit plants. Since we know it takes four spindly grub fruit plants to produce 800 calories of spindly grub fruit per cycle, we can then take that 90 and divide it by four and say, we're gonna be able to produce 22 and a half spindly grub fruits per cycle. Well, we know each Spindly grub fruit is going to give us a roasted grub fruit nut. So we can then take that 22 and a half and multiply it by the 1200 calories that each roasted grub fruit nut gives us. And that gives us a total of 27,000 calories, which means we can feed 27 duplicates on roasted grub fruit nut using just that one liquid sulfur geyser. And the way the math works out, the grub fruit preserve doesn't actually give us more calories per cycle than the spindly grub fruit because we know it takes eight grub fruit plants to produce 2,000 calories in a cycle. So eight divided by the 90 total plants we have is 11 and a quarter and 11.25 times our 2,400 calories that the grub fruit preserve provides. It's still 27,000 calories. All that complicated math aside, you need to do that math to figure out, hey, I can support 27 duplicates off of this one liquid sulfur geyser. Not too shabby considering we're also producing barbecue from our beautiful Drecos and Glossy Drecos. So right now, based on the calories that we have in meat and barbecue and the calories we're gonna be getting in our grub fruits, I think we have enough food for about 40 duplicates. Now that we figured out how much this liquid sulfur geyser can actually feed, now we need to go about the business of getting the sulfur out of it. Unfortunately, this liquid sulfur comes out hot at 165 degrees. I have a plan. It's stupid. And here's the plan. Little difficult to see with all the blueprints, but we're using our thermoregular setup and we're going to try to cool this room down as much as possible and that way we can have the liquid sulfur hit its solid point at 115.2. Now this shouldn't be too bad. It's very cold in this room to start off with. Plus we're going to put a bunch of temperature shift plates and we don't need a ton of cooling. In fact, remember our grub fruit plants can go all the way up to 50 degrees before they stifle. So that's going to be our goal. We're going to try to make sure all the sulfur gets down to about 40 degrees ship it off to our other colony using the supply teleporter input. Unfortunately, with only two dupes, this is going to take a minute. And to fill our cooling loop, we're going to use all this beautiful hydrogen we've been collecting at the top of the colony. Unfortunately, that's also another long run, this time with gas pipe. Our beautiful thermal regulator has almost all the hydrogen it needs for its cooling pipe. 
there it is it just filled up so i think we can go ahead and remove this gas bridge and once we do that we're gonna lock this thing up now as for the temperature of the hydrogen we're gonna keep it we're gonna start off with say 20 degrees before we lock it up though we need to put some temperature shift plates now we don't have anything overly great so we're just gonna use something that we have plenty of like igneous rock now igneous rock is slow heating which means it'll cool and heat very slow. So the immediate change provided by the liquid sulfur geyser won't be too big of a deal. So we'll take our little igneous rock tiles and just sort of pepper these things around. All right, I think our tamer is finally complete. We've got the beautiful igneous rock temperature shift plates. Now all we need to do is lock it up and we'll be good here. We got about 12 and a half cycles to go not too shabby in the meantime let me show you what we've been up to on our main colony and that is our future grub fruit and spindly grub fruit farm a quick look you'll notice the auto sweepers are separated enough to where they can hit every single tile and still be able to hit a storage bin in between them each these storage bins will be loaded up with our beautiful sulfur and the auto sweepers will take care of all the fertilization that each plant needs now there are not 90 farm tiles here there are actually 84 we've saved six farm tiles off for a very specific reason those six farm tiles will save us 60 sulfur per cycle well that's because we have a beautiful little sweetle ranch over here and each one of these sweetles requires 20 kilos per cycle so we'll have enough sulfur to raise three sweetles and 84 grub fruit plants simultaneously. In return, these sweetles will not only give us more eggs, which will eventually turn into meat that we can make barbecue out of, but also sucrose. And remember, if you will, we want to make grub fruit preserve, which requires four kilos of sucrose. Now, the math isn't perfect. Those three sweetles are going to give us 30 kilos of sucrose per day. Well, remember, we're shooting for about 11 grub fruit preserves per day. 11 and a half grub fruit preserves a day requires 46 kilos of sucrose. Now, I'm still not too worried about it because we already have 30 and a half tons. And this is before we even started creating the grub fruit preserve, before any of these sweetles start really providing too much of it. Now, before we even start receiving our sulfur over from the other planetoid we still have 75 tons sitting in stockpile so i think we're actually going to start loading these things up just grab our grub fruit seeds now that we have one copy the settings and go right over now you also notice these sweetles here these sweetles aren't here because we want sweetles here we actually want grub grubs and grub grubs come from these sweetles tending to the spindly grub fruit plants, and then that'll increase the chances that they have in laying a grub grub egg. And while the sweetles can tend to our spindly grub fruit plants, the grub grubs do just a lot better. And why do we care about these divergent critters? Well, this grub fruit plant that was a spindly grub fruit plant is now sweetle tended. Once a spindly grub fruit plant gets sweetle tended, it turns into a grub fruit plant. And additionally, Whenever these are tended by a grub grub or a sweetle, they actually grow faster too. Which means our original estimates of however many dupes that we could support, it's even greater than that because now they'll grow faster. And the grub grubs, well, they have a better bonus than the sweetles. You ever wonder how they turn them into grub fruits? Well, now you don't have to wonder. These little bugs are amazing. And here's one of our grub grubs now. And remember, the sweetle tended gave us 5% growth speed, whereas the grub grub rub gives us an amazing 50% growth speed. So because that math instantly becomes almost irrelevant based on either a sweetle tending or a grub grub rub, who knows how many dupes all of these grub fruit plants can feed. Now, it's only been a couple of cycles. We've managed to get all these grub fruits planted, and you'll notice there's not a single spindly grub fruit among them. 
even though we only have a few of these critters here. Since we had a little downtime waiting for this liquid sulfur geyser to go off, I figured I'd switch this over to chlorine. It's doing great. The hydrogen's already transferring its cool into the chlorine. See the chlorine's down to about 18 degrees. It's gonna fluctuate a little bit. Most of our food is still deep frozen and good. It'll take a little while to regulate, but I wanted to point out something about the difference between chlorine and carbon dioxide, and it's a choice that you need to make. We have some example chlorine over here, and you can see that it has a specific heat capacity of 0.48. Remember, the specific heat capacity is kind of like the battery that holds the chill or the heat. We go down here, we have some carbon dioxide, and you'll notice the carbon dioxide has a much better specific heat capacity at 0.84. What this means is this chlorine here in the deep freezer is not going to be able to hold as much heat, or in this case, chill, which means our thermal regulator is going to have to work a little bit more. To what measure is probably not a big deal, but it's definitely something we're going to be keeping an eye on, especially considering how touchy our system is here. Now, right now, the thermal regulator is not going above 40 degrees now versus the 30 degrees prior. But it could also be the fact that it's re-chilling this whole area again. And here we are. It's our first eruption of our liquid sulfur geyser. Right now, the sulfur is sitting at about 105 degrees. And our hydrogen's not doing too bad. It's still hovering around 20 degrees. And if we consider the mission of this thermal regulator just to turn it into a solid, I think we've done just that. It's dropped 60 degrees since it erupted instantly. Now, none of these temperature shift plates have really reacted too much yet. Remember, we chose igneous rock because it takes a while to change in temperature. We're going to adjust this down to minus 20. Hydrogen can stay there pretty much as long as we're able to maintain it in between eruptions. So I'm gonna give it a couple more cycles just to see what kind of thermal equilibrium we can hit. So I've gone a few cycles trying to weigh what we could do. I'm not 100% convinced on this system quite yet. I kind of almost want to fill the whole thing with water and that way it'll turn to steam and then cool down and then turn to steam. That might be our next attempt, but that's not gonna happen for 100 cycles. So that's about all we're going to do for this episode when it comes to this geyser. Now, eventually, when we need the sulfur, we'll be able to turn this conveyor loader on and be able to siphon everything out. I'm not worried about the equipment in here. It's all made out of steel. So it's overheat temperatures at 275 degrees. Even at max, this thing is only going to get up to 165 degrees. So we're fine there. In fact, we can move in this entire ethanol pond right in here. It'll give it a lot more mass to be able to dump its heat and chill into. That way, as soon as the sulfur comes out, it hardens and then we can scoop it away. Now, that's another thing to point out. When we do turn this auto sweeper system on, we're going to be pulling all these chunks out. We would prefer to do it when they're already chilled. But if we have to come up with a different system, we can pull them all out when they're hot, which will help this whole system actually run cooler. Not sure. If you have any ideas, Leave some suggestions in the comments below. But so far, so good. Our farm's going well. Our colony recovered from the giant deconstruct command. I'm keeping a little bit of mealwood going just because it never hurts to have a little pickle meal sitting in the deep freezer. Our power system's still working like a charm. So, so far, dupe only power's going well. I hope you had a good time in this episode. I know I did. I'll talk to you soon.